Các bạn có thể nghe mọi lúc, mọi nơi Chỉ với một chiếc điện thoại và tai nghe Rất tiện lợi và dễ dàng để thực hiện Nào hãy đến với bài Listen to số 30 ngày hôm nay ngay thôi Part 1 Here a tutor and two students discussing modern European writers. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Okay, so to continue our look at modern European writers who have focused on the future in their work, today we're talking about H.G. Wells. Last week, I asked you both to do some background research on Wells, which we're going to discuss now. Gitanjali, tell us about H.G. Wells. Right. So... H.G. Wells was a hugely successful British science fiction writer. Writing at the end of the 19th and the start of the 20th century, and much of his work focused on predicting the future. Jason, do you think Wells was just using the future as a narrative device in his fiction? No, no. He really believed we can predict the future. In fact, he gave a speech at the Royal Institution in London in 1902 called The Discovery of the Future. And the point he was making was that by looking at what you know about the present and about science, it's quite possible to predict the future. Indeed. Gitanjali, do you think Wells was always optimistic in his predictions? Not at all. In fact, he varied in his predictions from being extremely pessimistic about the future to being optimistic. Interestingly, one theory I read links the attitude in Wells's work to his own health. When he was writing The Time Machine, which was published in 1895, he'd just been diagnosed with an incurable fatal disease. Not surprisingly, the book is very pessimistic. Being about a dystopia in the future, a long time in the future, the year 802-701, in fact, where there are two races on Earth, the Morlocks and the Eloa, and the Morlocks actually eat the Eloa. I thought it was interesting, though, that it was H.G. Wells who actually came up with the phrase time machine. So despite being pessimistic, the work has had a lasting effect on our culture. Right. After the time machine, though, H.G. Wells didn't die, of course. And his recovery might be why he began to be a bit more optimistic about the future. So that brings us to his first utopia, Anticipations. Jason, tell us about that. Well, Anticipations, or to give it its full title, Anticipations of the Reaction of the Mechanical and Scientific Progress Upon Human Life and Scientific Thought, was published in 1901 and was set in the New Republic of the year 2000. Some of the things Wells predicts are fairly close to our reality today, including 24-hour news, global telecommunications, and even a European Union. We'll come back to the accuracy of Wells' predictions a little later. Gitanjali, how was Wells' work received at the time? Well, although Wells was extremely successful, not everyone respected his work or his predictions. Another well-known science fiction writer, Jules Verne, viciously attacked him for works such as The First Man in the Moon, which Verne argued weren't rooted in scientific fact at all. That's right. Now, Wells wrote a number of other utopian visions of the future. Jason? Yes. In a modern utopia published in 1905, his vision was of a world where there's no private property, where everyone has access to wonderful health care and, interestingly, where everyone's personal information is stored on cards in a central database outside Paris. Apart from the health care, I'm not sure everyone today would see that as a positive view of the future. Neither am I. And, on a similar note, 
Wells strongly believed in population control and in the shape of things to come, which was published in 1933, he sees and supports a world where the population is kept at 2 billion. Once again, I'm not sure most people today would necessarily see that as a good thing. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Gitanjali, in your research, did you come across anything about the world brain? Yes, I did. It's actually very interesting. Throughout the 1930s, Wells predicted and supported the setting up of a huge world encyclopedia. And towards the end of the decade, in 1938, he wrote a series of essays called World Brain. In these essays, he called for the world to make use of modern technology to create an enormous global encyclopedia so that all our knowledge is available to all people, not just an educated elite. Wells envisioned this as probably being on microfilm. He thought it would allow anyone, anywhere in the world, to look at any book or any document. He also thought it would be created by everyone, once again, not just by an elite. Yes, and as you can imagine, many people today say that the internet has basically fulfilled his prediction. Of course, it doesn't use microfilm, but essentially, it does meet all Wells's main requirements. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Section 2. You are going to hear a lecture about dining services. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 11 to 14. Welcome to the Dining Commons. This is the newest facility on campus, and I am proud to say also one of the best. I know that all university students miss eating home-cooked food. Well, this year, we are hoping to provide students with food and services that will make you feel at home, even without your family. The administration has been listening to the voice of the students. Students gave us frequent suggestions last year as to how we could improve the university. One of the most frequent suggestions was improving the dining options. We have been working hard all summer to come up with ideas that will make student life in the dormitories more pleasant. One of the new options we are offering in the dining facilities is variety in student meals. Last year, there was a set menu for every dinner, so if students didn't like the food, there was no choice. Students had to eat whatever was served. But this new dining facility has three completely unique areas, each with a different theme. At every meal, there will be three options for students to choose from. For example, there might be Italian food at station number one, which might consist of pizza and pasta. At station number two, there would be American food, consisting of hamburgers and hot dogs. At station number three,
there could be vegetarian soups and salads, accommodating all the vegetarians. We hope that with the greater selection of food, all students will find something to their liking. Now look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 15 to 20. Not only will students have more options, the food will also be better. Each section of the facility will have a head chef. These are real chefs that have been trained in culinary school and have been hired specifically by the school to work in the dining facilities. All of the chefs have a speciality. The school is hoping that these chefs will prepare better tasting and more nutritious food. Every student will be able to make suggestions and also give their input as to which menus taste better. Last year, many students complained that the dining facilities didn't have very convenient hours. This year, we hope to change that. We will open for breakfast at 6am to accommodate all the early risers. In the evenings, we will open until midnight for all the students that like to go for a late night snack. The afternoons will still remain closed, but we will have a student store open that will provide all students with drinks and fruit. The student store will be open every day from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Every student that has paid full tuition and dormitory fees has already paid for their dining facility fees. Students can eat at any time and in any amount for free. If you are a student that does not live in a dormitory, you can still purchase a dining facility card. This card will entitle you to the full services of the dining facility. This card is available only for students and is not open to the general public. If you are not a student and wish to dine here, you must purchase meals at the door. There are a few rules to follow. Even though we do not limit the amount of food that can be taken, we do not want students to waste food. Please do not take more than you can eat. Also, Every student must clean his or her own trays and plates. We will provide plates and trays for student use, but please do not abuse these items. Please do not leave your plates on the tables. Your parents are not here to clean up after you anymore, so I hope all students will be responsible. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the upcoming year. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. We'll hear a talk given by a lecturer to a group of civil engineering students on the reed bed system for sewage treatment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today about what is now called the reed bed sewage treatment system. 
This system uses naturally occurring reeds to treat domestic and industrial waste. It's an environmentally friendly alternative to normal systems. You all know what reeds are like, don't you? Those tall plants with hollow stems that grow in wet places, like marshes, for example. Here's how the system works. First of all, an artificial marsh is created. To do this, holes are dug about one meter deep and usually rectangular in shape. They are then lined with clay or plastic, and the liner is covered with gravel. After that, a system of tubing is laid with holes in it, and more gravel is added to cover that. Finally, reeds are planted in the bed. The sewage is brought to settling tanks. From there, it is distributed to the roots of the reeds through the tubing. Note that the waste material enters the beds underground and remains underground. The reeds conduct oxygen very efficiently through their stems to the root system. Here, bacteria work to reduce the waste material to basic elements. What comes out of the artificial marsh is water that has been cleaned through a natural process. The purified water leaves the reed bed through a simple outflow pipe. The water that comes out has to be tested. Sometimes it's held in a pond until it evaporates or soaks into the ground. Sometimes, after testing, the water is discharged directly into streams and rivers. Before the talk continues, with questions from the students. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. The reed bed system originated in Germany in the nineteen seventies, and installations have been built in a number of countries throughout the world. To give you an idea of the size and appearance of a reed bed installation, an area of three by five meters approximately would be adequate for a single house. It would look like a pond overgrown with reeds. There are cities with a hundred and fifty thousand people in Germany, whose entire sewage treatment requirements are served by reed bed installations, which extend for ten to twenty hectares. There are two wonderful environmental advantages. First of all, reed bed systems are natural composters. As time passes, high grade soil builds up in the beds. The soil can be removed and used for agricultural purposes. Soil produced from waste containing heavy metals would, of course, have to be tested, and the toxic material removed by chemical processes. An additional advantage is that the reed bed can function exactly as a marsh, providing a healthy natural home or habitat for waterfowl and other birds, insects, reptiles, and mammals. But there are practical advantages to a reed bed system over existing sewage treatment plants as well. At all levels, the cost is lower than for normal systems. Labor costs are a fraction of the costs of a conventional system. Typically, a large-scale reed bed installation will cost ten percent less than a mechanical system. They require little maintenance, and unlike mechanical systems, the efficiency of reed beds increases over time. But before we go any further, you must have some questions. Maybe this sounds too good to be true. That's exactly what I wanted to ask. If these systems have so many benefits, why aren't they more popular? Why don't we see them everywhere? As I said, the technology is now almost forty years old. Demonstration projects of all types have been built and monitored, and are slowly convincing regulators of the advantages of the system. But you have to understand that regulating authorities are by nature conservative and resist change. Typically, there's a lot of opposition to these systems by manufacturers and by everyone involved in maintaining the conventional systems. 
Reed bed systems require fewer staff to operate, so there would be a decline in the workforce. Therefore, unions would resist the change as well. What happens to reed beds in winter? Does the efficiency decrease? The above ground part of the plants die back in cold weather, but the roots remain alive and active, and the system continues to work just as effectively in winter. As soon as the weather warms up, new reeds appear and grow quickly. Is there a problem with mosquitoes in these ponds? Well, they're not exactly ponds with standing water. The beds look more like a field covered with long grass. The soil is moist, but not like a swamp, so there would be no more mosquitoes than in any other field. Remember, the effluent enters the beds underground and remains underground. Okay, let's get into some of the technical details now, and I'll answer questions as they come up. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture about dorm rooms. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen to the tape and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Welcome to your new home for the upcoming year. These dorm rooms are among the best in the nation and are the newest ones at this school. So I hope you will all learn to appreciate them and take good care of all the facilities here. I am Gina, and I will be residential advisor in this building for the year. Today, I am going to tell you about some of the programs and facilities that are available to you. I will also be telling you the rules that everyone is expected to abide by. I will be asking you to give me your full attention for the next few minutes. I will first tell you about the facilities that are available to you. The dining facility is located on the first floor of the building. It is open seven days a week from 7 a.m. to midnight. All the food offered to students is freshly made every day, and my own opinion is that the food is actually quite good. Feel free to come and grab a banana for breakfast, or sit down with a group of friends for dinner. Although your meals are served buffet style, please do not waste food. All students are expected to clean their own tables after meals. In the basement of this building, there is a gym and recreational hall. The gym has workout equipment such as treadmills and weight sets. In the recreational hall, there are ping pong tables and a pool table for student use. You must sign in when using this equipment, and you will be held responsible for any damages or losses. The gym and recreational hall are open daily from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. There is a kitchen located on the second floor of this building. Your dorm key will open this door. Inside, there is a refrigerator, a microwave, an oven, and a stove. This room is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you decide to cook a meal, please be considerate to all the students and clean up after yourself. You can use some food in here, but please do not make a mess. Some students do end up having their food eaten from the fridge, so be careful. Don't leave anything that looks like it tastes really good. Do not leave pots and pans lying around in the kitchen. Please store these in your room. There are many programs being sponsored by our building this year. One of the most popular is our Saturday morning outings. In the past years, these trips have included going fishing, hiking, cycling, ice skating, and even going to the beach. There will be a listing of scheduled events coming out soon. The university sponsors these trips, so transportation will be provided.
However, there are usually some costs associated, though they are usually minimal. Our building also has a volleyball team. All students who live in this building are welcome to join. Last year we won first place in the dorm league. Please sign up at the front desk if you are interested as soon as possible, as there are only 20 spaces available, based on a first-come, first-serve rule. The last things I want to talk about are the rules of our building. I know rules can be boring, but they are necessary to ensure the welfare of everyone living here. First, noise levels must be kept to a minimum after 11 p.m. Many students have early classes, so for those of you that have the luxury of sleeping until 10, please don't stay up late making lots of noise. Secondly, all visitors must sign in at the front door. Even if you have friends that are regular visitors, they must still always sign in. This rule is to prevent theft and robbery from occurring. Thirdly, alcohol and drugs are not permitted in this dorm in any place or at any time. Lastly, just be safe and have a great time. University is the greatest time of your life, so make the most of it. Thank you all for your attention. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Bạn đã bắt đầu luyện nghe IELTS hay chưa? Hãy chia sẻ với thầy và các bạn khác cách các bạn luyện nghe ngay phía dưới phần comment nhé. Chào và hẹn gặp lại!